Hello and welcome to The Shakedown. Our mission is to inform people about how the criminal justice system works, the real people impacted by the justice system, and methods to improve justice through compassionate and casual conversation. Hosts of The Shakedown share over 50 years of combined personal experience dealing with Texas prisons and working to change the criminal justice system. And now, here's our show. That's the thing that the justice system has to constantly work against is that you have the Eighth Amendment, which is assuring that you have a speedy trial. And that's part of why you have to, if they can't get out, if the judge can't hear your case in X amount of time, then you're, that right is being lost. And it sounds like that's part of what's happening, too, is that because they can't do that for one, one reason or another, they're getting they're just getting thrown out entirely well with with covid you know we didn't try cases for a year or two uh and now we're coming out of that but we still were filing criminal cases not as many but we're still filing criminal cases so the backlogs after covid were huge and so trying to determine what cases and getting a system to get these cases um done and resolved i mean we've got probably fewer 20% fewer people in the prison systems because no cases were being tried. And so the state systems are probably 20% or more over what capacity, what they normally have, because the people that would be, if they had their case tried, would be moved to the prison system are still waiting trial. And a lot of those cases are getting dismissed because, you know, we just have too much chaos going on. Do you have any, uh, I mean, do you know what kind of crimes you're talking about? What, uh, like in the, 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 uh, the activity going on in San Francisco like, uh, at the Nancy Pelosi building where you're saying that uh, they're being told not to come to work because it's so dangerous. What, what kind of crime is that? I mean, are there, is it, is it assault or robbery or what? Well, I, the, the article that I read, it was, uh, I think a lot of it was drugs uh, in the, in that area, you know, they've kind of stopped filing criminal cases on drugs. And so, you know, like Portland and there's areas in San Francisco that just kind of are like an open opium door, uh, den at the moment. Uh, we, we kind of have taken this position that we're going to help more people if we don't, uh, use the criminal justice system, but in effect, we're doing nothing. We're just, allowing these people to overdose. We're setting record numbers of overdoses in these areas every month. Um, And, you know, they've spent a lot of money on programs, but we're finding that less than 0.1% of these people are electing to go into programs because we're making it all voluntary. Under the under the system that works, you arrest them. You're arrested for these drug charges. You can either decide to go to rehab or you can go to prison. And that's the hammer that gets people to go to rehab. And you need that hammer because rehab has a 75% failure rate. And so they're going to have to go a well, couple of times. The other part about it too, about the, with um, drugs, the, the areas where people are using drugs, um, that's been tried in a bunch of different countries and the way they've had successful models and they've had failing models. And like you said, whenever they just decriminalize um, substances and let them go, it ends disastrously. Like mm-hmm. um, I believe it was in Amsterdam. They had a whole park where it was like completely um, decriminalized. And then no one went to that park because Every basically everyone would go there, use there'd be needles everywhere. Like they could not have families or anyone around in that area because that's what happened. Um, and then I believe in Canada, the what what worked really well was that they ended up they had safe use spaces, but the spaces were monitored by people who actually were were medical staff and basically. Yeah. They have they, they, sites in Canada, right? Yeah, and they and they basically they had they they gave them clean syringes, they tested the drugs beforehand, 
and then they measured the doses so that they so basically they could use with their supervision and then if anything happened they would be they were right there next to a hospital and and supervised with someone with emergency medical training and there has been zero um, deaths or anything from them and a lot of people who have gone to those sites and I don't have the numbers on this a lot of people have decided to stop using um, even though it would it was legal for them to use in those spaces and because it it was not um, using like extremely heavy substances like meth or heroin or whatever it like it's you're taking it reduces your life over time at the end of the day. So they, there's an end point and then they, they self administered themselves, but they didn't have like the so crash can't. of having to be in prison or, or fortunately or hurting someone else in the process. So that's one of the big advantages of having like a, a very highly monitored safe space. Whereas if you have the hammer, like, and I can speak from my own experience because I had the, I'm about to go to prison, so you gotta, you gotta go to rehab, and with that experience, I, I've seen, I, I listened, like, I, I was like, I'm, I'm going to listen now because I can't, there's, I had like no, I felt like I had no choice at that point, um. And, but I've seen lots of other people who they weren't ready to listen. They because but like their thing, I, I I'll, I'll put it this way. My parents were telling while I'm in treatment, they're like, you don't have a drinking problem. You have epilepsy. You had a seizure. You had a this. You had a that. And it's like and that's exactly what most addicts need. All they need is an excuse, something to blame it on, something to, to push it off on. And they they will. But they need at some point there will look, be. Look, no I excuses. have a personal experience on this as well. I have a sister yeah. who had a car accident in 1989, the year I graduated from law school. I graduated in May, and in October she had a car accident, and she broke every bone in her face. You could have stuck your finger through her mouth and out her eye socket, wow. and she started a 30-year addiction to prescription medications. I mean, I. It, at one point, as a very young attorney, I tried to get her put in jail uh, because that was the poor, poor family's drug rehab. I mean, all the things you're talking about, we tried with her. All the, you know, the get her into rehab, psh, check right out. Met her husband, second husband in rehab. Uh, they were arrested leaving a crack house. I mean, uh, at the end of her life, her husband died having a heart attack. Uh, I had her de declared incompetent. And the way we straightened her out was she was in an assisted living facility and they had control of all of her medications and they gave them to her as scheduled. And that was probably the first time in 20 or 30 years that she was probably doing the best she'd ever done. I mean, her family, other than me, would have anything to do with her at the end because they had had so many years of trying to trying to intervene and get her to go to treatment and she would have very little spells of success and long 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 spells of failure and uh, even uh, probably within the last two years of her life she was asking me to approve her getting a narcotic uh, prescription and i said no and her reaction was to pull off all of her toenails uh, yeah. and so uh <laughs> look uh, i i this is something I have a pretty strong opinion about, you know, getting people to go and getting treatment. I mean, I know they have to decide, but if you don't have a hammer, I mean, if we give up on drugs, we're giving up on crime because 80% of all crime some way gets traced back to drugs. Yeah. I, have a, I don't know if I can agree with that one, but I'm wondering how it is. I don't know. I'm wondering how it is that these people are going into work where somehow uh, unsafe because there's people doing drugs in the area. No, I think it was more than that. I think car thefts as well. It wasn't safe for them to park their cars uh, without them being broken into or stolen. And also uh, walking into the building, they'd be assaulted um, by people as well. So, and these are the crimes that were that were decriminalized, breaking into. I mean, no, I don't no, not fault. decriminalized, but the, nobody was prosecuting. You know, we we defunded the police, so they're 
you know, short of police officers. They just don't have the, the manpower and that's not a safe place to go anymore. You know, so they finally said, y'all, the, the federal employees need to work from home and, and for the foreseeable future because it's not safe to go to work. I mean, come on, guys. You would think that we would all agree if they, if we're if it's not safe to go to work, crime's a problem. And yet we're still trying these untested without research theories that and and we're getting reaping the results of them well yeah but some of it comes down to i mean comes down to just what's fair i mean why why bail, why, why the bail system un, i mean it affects the the current system hits poor people a whole lot harder than it does wealthy people i, I don't, and I, don't I know agree people with that. that have been to jail and have lost everything for two weeks in jail for something that they didn't do I mean, they lost. They lost because they're they're wage earners like me. I mean, they, they go to work. And they they uh they live paycheck to paycheck. Two weeks in jail, you get fired. Look, if you You're look, there's okay. There's jail. a study. There's a study that I highlighted on my podcast where it's talking about why people languish in jail, and the number one reason why people languish in jail is not because of, of poverty or their ability to pay for a bond. I mean, if you've got a thousand dollar bond and a bondsman will post it for a hundred dollars and get you out for 20 bucks in a payment plan, you don't have, there's not a problem setting a bond. The number one reason why people languish in jail is because of their criminal history. And once you're in jail, when you have a criminal history and you're in jail because your bond is set higher, then it's not because you're poor. It's because you have a criminal history because you're a risk to public safety. And why is, why is that an issue of fairness? What, does it, doesn't the public have a right to safety? Because what you're saying by saying that someone is a risk to public safety is saying is, is punishing someone for potentially committing a crime that hasn't happened yet. No, that's, that's one of the assurances that you have to give to the court to be let free is that you will not commit a new crime and that you will re- return to answer the charges. That's what our society is based upon. The person now, I just told you about that just got out of jail a couple of months ago didn't commit any crime to begin with. He, that's why he was eventually let go after spending two months in jail. Well, but isn't that part of the problem? You're, you know, we're going to have even less faith in, the, faith in the criminal justice system because of all the chaos that's being created. They can't triage the cases to determine which ones they need to go forward with and which ones they just need are valid dismissal. I, They're I can, dismissing in mass. I agree with your with your with your basic assertion that that. We're safer as a society. There will be less crime, I guess you can say, if you lock more people up. But then again, you see that in, and you see that in societies like uh, Iran and, and things like that, where they have very draconian rules, where, where they prosecute crimes with put, cutting off hands and things like that. Yeah, they almost have a non-existent crime rate. So yeah, being I mean being harsher yeah, on people but is that a really is that scary. a true is that a true comparison here? I mean, we have a lot of people in jail because every of- country in the world sends their drugs to the United States. So we have all the drugs coming here. So of course we're going to have a higher percentage of people in prison than than most people. I mean, they've got just as many drugs in other countries as they do here. They just don't prosecute them the same way. Yeah. So really, I mean, if you're talking about the drugs and they send all the drugs here. <clears throat> So isn't it a matter of education? Because people are nobody's forcing you, anybody to do drugs. They're doing them because they want to do them. So educate them. I mean, so well, I mean, you know, that's part of the problem in our urban areas. We've our schools have failed. I mean, there was a study recently from some uh, privileged school in uh, some urban area, and every student in in the school was below uh, grade level on reading and math. And so I think schools have failed. Um, we're we're seeing it every day where we're we're not teaching reading, writing, arithmetic. We're teaching we're teaching that we should be uh, using proper pronouns. We should be reacting to certain way to social uh, experiments. Uh, so I think we have problems with that. We have problems with drugs in our urban cities. We have problem with families. You know, I, I did a podcast with the sheriff of Tarrant County, and he said. Eighty percent of the population in his jail share three things. The first one is no father in their life. No, number two, no education, and number three, some outside influence, whether it's uh, gangs or mental health. You know, mental health is an issue we haven't even talked about. You know, no, I was going why there. is the why <laughs> is the Harris County Jail the largest mental health facility in the state of Texas? I can uh, agree with you on that one too. But what's the alternative? I mean, you know, I mean, this was not a, a new. Th- I mean, this was not. 
a controversial theory when it came out, but the, you know, the broken windows theory. And also if you cannot, uh, change course and become a productive member or a non crime committee person in society, we will lock you up. And that's how we will provide public safety. I mean, if you think about it, just take a step back. We're, we are committing the same mistakes we did in the sixties. In the sixties, we felt safe. And so we were more forgiving on crime. We let more people out of jail, out of prison. Crime started going up. And so then we started fighting amongst ourselves about how to address it. Uh, we had one side of the spectrum that wouldn't agree to do anything. And so we ended up having a backlash. We had Reagan. We had tough on crime. Even Clinton was tough on crime for a while. And now we're back to where we were in the 60s. Uh, or we were five years ago. We felt safe. And so we started being more forgiving on crime and we're having the same cycle take place once again. Yeah. Well, as someone who was actually locked up during that period of time of the tough on crime thing and spent 30 years in prison because of it, and that's that's why I have the problems that I do is because I've seen what happens whenever you get real draconian and you don't care and you decide that okay, it's Okay, so important. as someone who was in jail for 30 years, what's the alternative? See, I knew that's where I thought you were going to go to, the alternative. And I understand, look, what you're going to say is absolutely correct. What you have going now is the better solution compared to any alternative I'm going to give you because it's, it's you already have the jails. You already have the police. You already have all these things. They have a, a momentum that's going that I can't possibly beat by any kind of scheme I can come up with right now. Okay. I can come up with I can come up with some ideas that, that are probing in the right direction, but... Ultimately, I just, I just don't believe that it's right. Well, if you don't mind me asking, what was the reason why you were in jail for 30 years? I went to, I went to prison for murder when I was a 17-year-old kid. But okay. the whole – but uh, here we're going to go into this. I went, to the, I went to jail at a time whenever they had this hysteria about teenagers and crime and all this type of thing. And so they labeled my crime as some kind of skinhead gang initiation murder and whatever. It had nothing to do with this whatsoever. I got, I was almost given the death penalty behind this. They were trying to, well, okay, so let's, about, it was all because of some Princeton professor that came out with this super predator theory and was telling well, everybody. Let's, let's compare that to now. Okay. Houston, Texas right now for the last several years. Um, you know, in Texas, if you were accused of murder, you didn't get out of jail. You were going to be in jail up until the time of trial, usually. Uh, but in Houston, with all these reforms and saying we need to be more fair, I mean, it was like you got one free murder before you would be held. And so people were being uh, arrested for murder, released, and some of them on personal bonds. And, and But then they were being held after they committed a second murder. And that's when people started getting very angry. It's like, you know, the dog bite. You get one free dog bite. You know, the murder thing is a very serious crime, no matter what your age. I mean, it's it's serious. And I I mean, you know, what are the You're consequences? Absolutely right. It's a serious you- crime. And I don't I don't I'm not trying to say that people shouldn't be punished for, for their crimes. But I am trying to say that before you've been convicted of a crime, you're you're not there's I don't understand why that you're treating them like they've committed a crime. Well, it goes back to what assurance and you know, like in Texas you know, we have the Texas Constitution that says there are certain crimes that uh, we we consider as a society to be so serious that the court has the authority to detain you, even though you haven't found, been found guilty. Because, you know, guilt or innocence has nothing to do with re- pretrial release. It's all about what assurance you're going to give the court that you're going to come back. Um, yeah, so you're, 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 you're unfairly... You're unfairly uh, giving a. You're giving all. I mean, it just goes the disadvantages that that go along with this. Absolutely, when I, was there seven, are. When I was 17 years old. I mean, I had. I mean, already just being 17 years old, you know nothing about the law. You have no money whatsoever. You're you you are a sitting duck for whatever the heck they want to do to you. And then you Absolutely. couple that with the fact that you can't get out of jail because you're because they posted this high bond and you don't have any money to begin with. I mean. And you can't even fight your case because your case is being fought in the in the media. Your fake case is being fought, and the in the the cops are, are are doing their investigation and talking to all the witnesses and everything okay, else. Okay, so what what could we have changed about your process? What could about we have my, changed? about my process? Yeah, well, well, where do you even start? You can you can start with what we're talking about. First and foremost, it would, have, it would have been fair if I would have been released on a PR bond, or at least given a fair, given a fair amount, of, a sum of money that I could have afforded, 
somehow, I don't know how, what you would come up with something that, that, that you could, some kind of agreement mm-hmm. by my family or something that, that would have gotten me out of prison so that I can, before we, before we move on, let me, let me yeah. just apply what we're seeing on bail reform uh, through litigation and apply that to your situation. So, you know, in the bail reform litigation, the argument was part of what you're saying, Hey, you can't hold anybody if they say they can't afford that bond. And so, and the arguments were you have a right to release. Now, most of that litigation was on misdemeanors, but there were some on felonies as well. And so there's this whole fight over, um, do you have a right to release or do you have a right to a hearing? And what the courts ultimately held was if you can't afford the bond that's set, you have a right to a hearing asking for a deviation to go down for a lower bond. And the courts have held now, we've had the 11th Circuit and the 5th Circuit hold, that that's all you have a right to. You have a right to a hearing asking for a lower bond. The Constitution does not require your release. So even though that was 30 years ago, the law is still the same today. You don't have a right to release. You I'm have a right to request with, a, a lower bond. I'm not arguing bond. with the Constitution has, or what the law has to say about this. I'm arguing whether or not that's right or wrong. And I can I know that the first thing that we want to jump to is that well they have the right they have the, the the law says that they can do this to you so since the law says they can that means that it's okay for them to do it but it's I mean I don't see how it's right for them to be able to take someone who is a much more mature individual who knows a whole lot more about the law and about and, and has money and all that and let them go and give them a fair chance of being able to defend themselves in a case where and other than and not do that for a teenager. Did you have your own attorney? Did you have a public pro- I had a public yeah. attorney, yes. Okay. So you were provided with a public att- attorney at the public's expense? Yes. So you had representation. Did you think they do a good job? No. Nope. I mean, it's kind of hard to say. They were very nice to me. And at the time, I don't know it. Like you said, like I said, I didn't know anything about the law. So it's hard to say if they did a good job or if they did a bad job. Well, okay, so I'm going to ask the toughest question. So the toughest question is, the jury found you guilty. Was that right or was that wrong? It was right for them to find me guilty. I was guilty of murder, but I wasn't guilty of murder under the circumstances they said I was. Okay, so you were you were found guilty of murder and you were assigned a punishment. Uh, and, you know, that goes, I mean, once you get to that point, I mean, I'm not even here talking about uh criminal justice reform for prisons. I don't really haven't looked at that issue. I'm talking about just pretrial release. Let me say this. I am all on board with um, reform. You know, you become, if you, Hey, i can be a productive citizen and you get your education through uh, prison and you, you know, whatever you want to do. We find Jesus. A lot of people make jokes about it, but you be, you, you turn and say, Hey, I want to be a productive. I'm all about showing mercy for that. The problem with that we have is our government, it's very difficult for them to do that. You know, we had the Federal First Step Act that was passed by uh, uh, Trump. And I, I had somebody from D.C. on my podcast talking about it. And he said, look, Ken, the government can't do individual assessments of people to determine whether they are going to be productive citizens. They can do across the board uh, release. And anything else is too expensive for the government. So the reason why the First Step Act had a cross-the-board release for certain who, people who meet, met certain criteria, that's all the government is good at. And that's why I'm critical of those types of things, because there's going to be too many mistakes. I'm, But I'm always in favor of individual assessment and determination. And if we think that, hey, you've changed, you you have the skills to be successful now, I'm all for that. It's just we don't I, have a very I good system for evaluating it. What, what you're saying. I, I, I can agree with what you're saying there, too. And for the most part, like I've said, I mean, I, I'm, I know I'm kind of contentious with you and all that, but for the most part, I think what you're saying is true. I mean, I, I don't really argue your numbers or any of that, you know, I just uh, some of the, the no, weather. No, no, no. I mean, look, we're not contentious at all. How can we be contentious when you're telling me you agree with me most of the time? <laughs> There you go. Well, it's just the points of, di- of disagreement right sure. every once in a while that kind of flare up. And I agree with what you're what you're saying about that you need to have people assess it. I think that is actually a vital piece that we don't have currently. We have too many. Like you said, they can't. 
if there is going to be any change right now, like a massive change, it's going to be blanket. And then if when you do a blanket change, just like you're talking about with the decriminalization, then it doesn't work. Or um, a good example is like what you're talking about in D.C. They in 2020, they defunded their police department by 15 million dollars. And now they're having issues because of it, because unfortunately, the catchphrase got stuck in the head, like the defund the police cut got in. But the other half of that, which is where what do you do with 15 million dollars when you take it away from somewhere? It's got to go someplace else to people to people who actually know who can uh, deal yeah, with. Yeah, but one the, of the arguments were we're not going to send police anymore. We're going to send caseworkers. And do you know, I mean, do you know how many times you can do that before the city has, I mean, so much liability exposure? I mean, who's triaging those cases to decide, oh, well, this is really just someone who needs a caseworker, so we're going to send a caseworker. They end up getting shot and killed. Then this, the county is going to be sued for that. I mean, and, and also, I would say, would have gross negligence for doing that. And so, I, you know, you end up sending a policeman and a caseworker, which would double the expense if you do it. Right. And that's a lot of places. That's what they've done. They've they've well, built a lot of places to, talked about it and then they couldn't didn't couldn't <laughs> increase the money. And so they ended up with fewer people working for them and no caseworkers. Right. And that, but this is that. It ends up being the question of what, how, like, so at that first spot, how are we triaging? Like, can we triage it to that every 911, is every 911 call going to a police officer? Can we send it to someone else? Are we ready to do that? Like, can can we break it down that way? Or does it everything have to, like, do we have to have, uh, like, here we have core teams in Longmont or a core team which is police officer, social worker, um, like addiction specialist, like, and they have like a whole team that goes out, but it's one team and they're overbooked constantly. Mm -hmm. And this is that that's part of the question that never got answered. And like I said, if you, it's hard, like you can, you do that, but like, you might be able to actually do that with if you set that up as the default of having sending a team, but you would you're going to have to change the way it's your police because you're not you, now you're taking away money from like raids and things like that, like bigger aspects that where a lot of the budget goes towards. I would argue that we are trying to make our criminal justice system into something that it was never intended to be. I mean, we've already failed schools, we've already failed families, and now we're saying, oh, yeah, we can fix all that right here in the criminal justice system. We just need to figure out what's missing in their lives, and we just need to figure out what we can do. You've already screwed all that up for for their whole lifetime until they're in the criminal justice system. The criminal justice system was made to arrest somebody, find out if they committed the crime, and then just impose the, the least amount of pressure to get you to become productive again as needed. And then if you came back, more pressure. And if you came back, more pressure. But that's not what it is anymore. No, it's 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 broken. It's completely broken. And it's broken because of chaos in our urban areas where we're trying all these reforms that do not work. And we have all this rhetoric that doesn't do anything but just shut down debate. And you have to treat everybody the same. It's We talk about fairness. And if you don't, well, then you're racist. And so how can we have a triage that's truly a triage if we're not treating everybody the same because then we're racist when that's the whole point of the criminal justice system is only to impose the least amount of pressure to get you to be, be productive again. And so what's good for you may not be the same amount of pressure that I need. And then the problem is – we have a disproportionate amount of crime being committed by certain racial groups. 50% of all murder victims in the United States are young black males. And who do you think are doing the murdering? Young black males. And somehow in our society, we've decided to favor the murderer over the victim right now. And that has got to change. It gets into the, like, and it, w- before when you were talking about what, like, looking at the crime rates over time. And then like, as we got more comfortable, we want to like first in the nineties, we were getting, we had a lot bunch of crime and we're like, no, please. 
um, we have a democratic president. We're going to sign more laws saying let's let's get police going. Let's get that. Let's get harsher sentences and yeah. mandatory minimums. We're going to arrest more. We're going to hire more right. fe- police officers with federal money. Right, and then and then and like in but whereas in the sixties and stuff like we're like we're comfortable things it's safer so let's not do that. I tend to think that that's not the reason that the, the that it was going that way, because it's more of there's a there's systemic issues that were that were there and like you and I also agree like the criminal justice system is really the way it's set up it's doing what it was meant to do and the question is is well if that's not doing if that's not keeping us safe and keeping and lowering crime and making sure that people have fair trials if that's not doing any of that then what's the point of having it you can find shakedown merch graphic novels and other projects at waywardpress.com that's w-a-y-w-o-r-d press.com if you would like to support the shakedown get exclusive content and watch episodes live you can support us at patreon.com slash the shakedown like subscribe and leave a comment to give malone that inner peace he so richly deserves